This investigation is sponsored by Blinkist. Once in a blue moon, you come across a case so convincing that it might completely change your belief system. This is one of those cases. The Stargate Project is the name of a top secret US military unit and its predecessors that operated from 1972 to 1995. Its purpose was to investigate the potential use of psychic powers for military and intelligence gathering purposes, particularly in the context of the Cold War. If you look up the Stargate Project online, most videos and articles talk about these experiments in a rather mocking fashion, like it was some crazy period in time when the government actually believed in this stuff. Psychic spies armed with supernatural powers. So why is this video any different? Well, I've personally read through over a thousand pages of declassified Stargate material, including the 183 page evaluation report that ultimately convinced the CIA to end the program in 1995. Let me tell you, this is not exactly a simple cut and dry topic. The CIA did cancel the program and yeah, they had a good reason to, which is extremely misunderstood and we'll be exploring that in detail. But despite all this, what they found over 23 years of experiments was compelling evidence that psychic abilities are real. Now, if you're a skeptic, I'm with you right there, there are definitely some questions that need answering. How do we know these so-called psychics weren't just clever frauds? How can we be sure the researchers didn't skew their results to fit a narrative? And most importantly, how do you know that I'm not just making this all up? Well, in this series, I'll be directly quoting from the CIA's archives, among other government agencies like the NSA and the DIA that have declassified material on the Stargate project. And we'll be addressing all of these concerns, and more, in gratuitous detail as we do for pretty much everything on this channel. You can check out my exact sources in the description below, but will you really be convinced? After you finish watching, let me know in the comments. This is part one where we'll learn about the history of the Stargate project and explore the most wild and shocking accomplishments of its primary focus, a psychic ability known as remote viewing. And next week in part two, we'll tackle the complex evolution of Stargate, the actual missions carried out by its most talented psychic spies, and Finally, we'll uncover the true reason why the CIA ended it, which you definitely won't expect. And you're going to be getting it all straight from the source. Hey fellow seekers, welcome. I'm Mr. Mythos. If you're a fan of strange, ancient, and in this case, top secret scientific mysteries with research so deep you're guaranteed to fall down the rabbit hole, you're in the right place. I humbly ask that you give this video a like and ding the notification bell so you don't miss any of the rare info we'll be digging into every video. And if you love it, share it around, let's get the people talking. But before we dive in, it's no exaggeration that I read well over a thousand pages of dense information for this project. I could have read Bill Bryson's 624 page behemoth, a short history of nearly everything, twice, but I'll let you in on a secret. I kinda did both. Today's sponsor, Blinkist, is one of my favorite services because it condensed nonfiction books into bite-sized summaries of all the most powerful ideas, and they call these Blinks. Basically, Blinkist is to books what Mr. Mythos is to the CIA Stargate archives. They do the research for you because time is valuable. Most Blinks only take around 15 minutes, like two I really enjoyed, A History of God and the Tao of Physics. But Blinkist doesn't compromise when it comes to big books like A Short History of Nearly Everything, around 40 minutes well spent, and let me tell you, they really pack in the gems. One of the coolest things I learned was that quantum physics and Einstein's theory of relativity aren't really compatible, even though both are scientifically valid. Basically, relativity applies to the larger forces in the universe, like time, while quantum physics explains things at the subatomic level like the movement of electrons. Why these two theories don't work with the other is one of life's greatest mysteries, but Blinkist does a great job in explaining both in simple terms. With over 5,000 titles in 27 categories, no matter what your interests are, you'll find a rabbit hole worth diving into. And right now, they've got a special offer for viewers of my channel. Click my link in the description to start your free 7-day trial with Blinkist and get 25% off a premium membership. Thanks again to Blinkist, let's dive right into one of the most fascinating modern mysteries, the Stargate Project 
and the possibility that we live in a psychic universe. The Stargate Project was a top secret unit of the US military, the final evolution of its predecessors, the projects codenamed Scanate, Gondola Wish, Grow Flame, Center Lane, Dragoon Absorb, Project CF, Sunstreak, and finally Stargate. Over its epic 23 year operation, it was overseen by the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, the Army Intelligence and Security Command, INSCOM, and the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, with many others involved, some of whom we may never know about as they've been deliberately redacted from the documentation. Stargate investigated what's known as parapsychology, otherwise understood as psychic abilities and related paranormal phenomena. Their initial research began in 1972 and lasted until 1995, with the ultimate goal being to create a trainable and accurate method of psychic spying. Though the Stargate Project investigated many different psychic powers, such as psychokinesis, the ability to influence the physical world with just the power of the mind, their primary focus was on remote viewing. Theoretically, remote viewing is using the mind's eye alone to observe and acquire direct information of locations, objects, and events that are blocked from ordinary means of perception. Usually, this implies a significant geographical distance between the remote viewer and the target. For example, a secret weapon storehouse on the other side of the world. The target might also be hidden by shielding, such as a file in a locked cabinet. However, these observations may also penetrate through time, as in a number of cases, remote viewers have seen the past or the future. At the time, the Stargate project developed the most rigorous set of protocols and controls ever used in remote viewing research to maximize every session's data quality and scientific validity. And this is pretty important to note because most coverage on this topic unfairly suggests that poor methodology was the cause for the project's death. That wasn't the case. According to the CIA's final evaluation, quote, The experiments are well designed, and the investigators have taken pains to eliminate the known weaknesses in previous parapsychological research. In these experiments, a viewer attempts to draw or describe a target location, photograph, object, or short video segment. All known channels for receiving the information are blocked. Sometimes the viewer is assisted by a monitor who asks the viewer questions. Of course, in such cases, the monitor is blind to the answer as well." End quote. Even with an understanding of the basic process and scientific rigor, it might still be hard to stomach some of the major accomplishments of the Stargate project. One remote viewer uncovered previously unknown details of a hostile nuclear testing site. Another discovered the world's largest submarine built by the Soviets before it was even launched. Yet another viewer located a lost enemy spy plane that was obscured beneath the African jungle. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are easily dozens if not hundreds of instances where a viewer provided key information from the inside, which no radar telescope or satellite imagery could possibly see. This is why Stargate's funding was approved on a year-by-year -year basis for more than two decades, at a cost of over $20 million. And if you're a US citizen, you paid for it with your taxes, so you deserve to know about it. Back then and even to this very day, it's the opinion of the primary researchers, as well as a number of government officials involved, that the Stargate project provided irrefutable proof of the existence of remote viewing. Even the CIA themselves, when questioned about it in 2021, wrote, quote, The assessments of the CIA officers involved in the program during the 1970s was that enough accurate remote viewing experiences existed to defy randomness, end quote. So, my question is, why do so many mainstream sources insist that there's no evidence of remote viewing? And why have the research findings of the Stargate project been ignored by the larger scientific community? Is it really that hard to believe in the possibility of psychic phenomena? But here's the thing about the Central Intelligence Agency. It doesn't matter how fringe the theory is. If it has potential, the CIA will explore it. Like in 1955, when they investigated whether Adolf Hitler was still alive and hiding in Colombia based on two witness testimonies and a rather grainy photo. 
Psychic powers, however, had been on the agency's list for a long time. According to the CIA, quote, From very early in CIA's history, we had been interested in whether extrasensory perception, ESP, or other paranormal phenomena, generally called parapsychology, exist, and if so, whether they had operational uses for intelligence. The earliest record our historians have found on this topic is a 1948 memorandum speculating on whether hypnotized people could be used for long-distance communication. We didn't, however, conduct our own research into psychic phenomena until the summer of 1972." End quote. What came in 1972 was the result of a perfect storm. The countercultural revolution of the 1960s brought with it a wave of New Age thinking that renewed mainstream interest in studies of human consciousness and the capabilities of the mind. But perhaps the biggest driver for the CIA and the military alike was the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. The years leading into the 70s were some of the most fast-paced, high-pressure, and paranoid of the entire century. On both sides it seemed as if the enemy was working harder and quicker and making non-stop progress toward the ultimate means of world domination. The race between the Americans and the Soviets was in full effect. However, the Soviets had one distinct advantage. They'd been conducting rigorous government-funded studies into psychic phenomena since the early 20s. Without getting into the Soviet Union's own complex parapsychological history, which we'll cover in a future video, all you need to know is that CIA intelligence reports revealed rapid progress and fearworthy successes being made by Russian parapsychologists. They also knew that by 1970, the Soviet Union was spending 60 million rubles per year on psychic experiments, and by 1975, that number had rose to over 300 million. Of particular concern, though, was the potential of remote viewing, because this psychic spying ability seemed to pass through geographic barriers and physical defenses like nothing. In 1977, the North Carolinian congressman Charlie Rose argued in a meeting with representatives from every U.S. state, quote, It seems to me that remote viewing would be a hell of a cheap radar system, and if the Russians have it, and we don't, we're in serious trouble. End quote. Little did the world know, though, that a top-secret psychic project was already underway, and it had been for seven years. At that time, this project was codenamed Gondola Wish, and it would eventually become Stargate, but at the very beginning, the summer of 1972. It wasn't called by any name. In fact, the term remote viewing didn't even exist yet. It was just two laser physicists who met a self-proclaimed psychic who was so incredibly convincing that the men in black decided to pay them a visit. Dr. Harold Patoff and Russell Targ were the key researchers of the first phase of the Stargate project, and these two were rather interesting people. Harold Patoff, a Stanford University graduate with a PhD in electrical engineering, was renowned for his field advancements in quantum electronics and zero-point energy. He was also a hardcore Scientologist, reaching what was then the top OT7 level. However, Dr. Patoff cut off all ties with the Church of Scientology just a few years into his involvement with the remote viewing project. Patoff was the program's first director, running it from its conception until his retirement in 1985. Also, even though his name is Harold, his colleagues just called him Hal. Hal Patov's research partner, Russell Targ, was arguably even less conventional. Both legally blind and at the same time an avid motorcyclist, Targ pioneered some of the earliest laser research with the first working lasers in the 1960s. And like Patov's close relationship with Scientology, Russell Targ had his own lifelong fascination with occult topics. As a child, he read books on theosophy and ancient astronaut theory, all of which he came across in his dad's occult bookstore in Chicago. However odd they may have been, both men had a demonstrated history as esteemed scientists and researchers, putting their own beliefs aside in pursuit of objective findings. In the winter of 1972, Targ was hired by Patoff as a senior research physicist at Stanford Research Institute 
also known as SRI. SRI had long been involved in special access government funded projects, top secret stuff but never anything parapsychological. That was until a few unexpected events led to a visit from the CIA. In Hal Patov's 1996 paper titled CIA Initiated Remote Viewing Program at Stanford Research Institute, he recounts the rather obscure beginnings of the project, which began with Patov confronting a bit of a scientist dilemma. Quote, In early 1972, I was involved in laser research at Stanford Research Institute. At that time, I was also circulating a proposal to obtain a small grant for some research in quantum biology. In that proposal, I had raised the issue whether physical theory as we knew it was capable of describing life processes and had suggested some measurements involving plants. This proposal was widely circulated and a copy was sent to Cleve Baxter in New York City who was involved in measuring the electrical activity of plants. New York artist Ingo Swan chanced to see my proposal during a visit to Baxter's lab and wrote me suggesting that if I were interested in investigating the boundary between the physics of the animate and the inanimate, I should consider experiments of the parapsychological type." End quote. This Ingo Swan, by the way, is a very important figure whose odd and sometimes extraordinary abilities we'll be exploring many times throughout this series. Swan was a visionary artist and a psychic from New York who, alongside Russell Targ and Harold Potoff, is recognized as the co-founder of the Stargate project. He would be the designer of the foundational remote viewing techniques that drove the program, the same one still used by remote viewers today. Pretty much everyone who worked with Swan, both inside and out of the project, noted that he had a deep interest in the technical and scientific aspects, which isn't so surprising as before meeting the two laser physicists, he'd already participated in some laboratory tests to better understand his own abilities. And speaking of which, Dr. Patov continues, quote, Swan went on to describe some apparently successful experiments in psychokinesis, in which he had participated at Professor Gertrude Schmeidler's laboratory at the City College of New York. As a result of this correspondence, I invited him to visit SRI for a week in June 1972 to demonstrate such effects, frankly as much out of personal scientific curiosity as anything else. Prior to Swan's visit, I arranged for access to a well-shielded magnetometer in the physics department at Stanford University." End quote. As Patov goes on to mention, this first experiment was a complete surprise to Swan, who had no idea he would be tested that day and definitely no knowledge of what challenge he'd be up against. A magnetometer is a device that measures the strength of a magnetic field and Swan would be tasked with manipulating the magnetic field around it. However, this was no ordinary magnetometer. Due to the experiments this particular one was being used for, it was located in a vault beneath the floor of the building and quadruple shielded by P-metal shielding copper shielding, an aluminum container, and a superconducting shield. As you can imagine, this was pretty ideal for testing a person who confidently claimed to be able to produce physical effects with just mental power alone, an ability known as psychokinesis. So as opposed to overwhelming you all with Patov's scientific details, I'll let the words of the CIA official and Stargate's first project officer, Dr. Kenneth A. Kress, Tell this part of the story. So the following is taken from Kruss's declassified 1977 report, Parapsychology in Intelligence. Quote, he was taken on a surprise visit to a superconducting shielded magnetometer being used in quark high energy particle experiments. The quark experiment required that the magnetometer be as well shielded as technology would allow. Nevertheless, when the subject placed his attention on the interior of the magnetometer, the output signal was visibly disturbed, indicating a change in the internal magnetic field. Several other correlations of his mental efforts with signal variations were observed. These variations were never seen before or after the visit." End quote. Ingo Swan would later recount that his psychokinetic feat shocked two student researchers so badly that 
one ran straight out of the room and another stumbled face first into a large support beam. Basically, the experiment was a real jaw dropper. In fact, in his paper, Dr. Patoff even mentions that Swan went on to show off some more, quote, as if to add insult to injury. He then went on to remote view the interior of the apparatus, rendering by drawing a reasonable facsimile of its rather complex and heretofore unpublished construction. It was this latter feat that impressed me perhaps even more than the former." End quote. Even though this experiment wouldn't be formally published until three years later, Dr. Patov did circulate a draft among his colleagues, and one of them must have felt strongly enough that they secretly forwarded a copy to the authorities. Patov recounted, quote, In a few short weeks, a pair of visitors showed up at SRI with the above report in hand. Their credentials showed them to be from the CIA. They knew of my previous background as a naval intelligence officer and then civilian employee at the National Security Agency NSA, several years earlier and felt they could discuss their concerns with me openly. There was, they told me, increasing concern in the intelligence community about the level of effort in Soviet parapsychology being funded by the Soviet security services. By Western scientific standards, the field was considered nonsense by most working scientists. As a result, they had been on the lookout for a research laboratory outside of academia that could handle a quiet, low-profile classified investigation, and SRI appeared to fit the bill. End quote. While the CIA was clearly serious, they did want some proof of their own before they put money on it. The CIA agents insisted that they themselves carry out a multi-day series of tests with Ingo Swan to assess whether or not he was a real deal, and Patoff agreed to arrange this. Quote, the tests were simple, the CIA visitors simply hiding objects in a box and asking Swan to attempt to describe the contents. The results generated in these experiments are perhaps captured most eloquently by the following example. In one test, Swan said, I see something small, brown and irregular, sort of like a leaf or something that resembles it, except that it seems very much alive, like it's even moving. The target chosen by one of the visitors turned out to be a small live moth, which indeed did look like a leaf. The integrated results were sufficiently impressive that, in short order, an eight-month, $49,909 biofield measurements program was negotiated as a pilot study. A laser colleague, Russell Targ, who had had a long-time interest and involvement in parapsychology, joined the program, and the experimental effort was begun in earnest." End quote. So this was the very beginning with Dr. Hal Patoff, Russell Targ, and Ingo Swan assigned to this biofield measurements program, which, by the way, was technically the true first name of the Stargate project. The first project officer, Dr. Kenneth Kress, describes Swan's descriptions of the hidden objects as startlingly accurate. However, maybe Swan cheated somehow or got lucky. Even though their money was invested, the CIA still had doubts on the ability to remote view. So they sent their own agents to participate in some of the earliest remote viewing tests, but would they be convinced? Quote, the CIA contract monitors, ever watchful for possible chicanery, participated as remote viewers themselves in order to critique the protocols. In this role, three separate viewers contributed seven of the 55 viewings, several of striking quality. Comparison of descriptions and drawings to pictures of the associated targets, generated by the contract monitors in their own viewings, leaves little doubt as to why the contract monitors came to the conclusion that there was something to remote viewing. See for example, figure 1 herein, as summarized in the executive summary of the now released final report of the second year of the program. The development of this capability at SRI has evolved to the point where visiting CIA personnel with no previous exposure to such concepts have performed well under controlled laboratory conditions, that is, generated target descriptions of sufficiently high quality to permit blind matching of 
descriptions to targets by independent judges. End quote. The CIA had the results they needed, and they confirmed it firsthand. Now, before we move on to the real meat of this story, it really can't be emphasized enough how incredibly involved Ingo Swan was in the early stages of the Stargate project, and how important he was to its development. Not only did his psychic feats validate their research, but he also got along quite well with Patov and Targ thanks to his own intense scientific interest. He was a psychic in search of understanding his own ability, and on a serious mission to hone his techniques. During his time at SRI, Swan would develop several remote viewing theories and methods, and two of these would become incredibly influential to both Stargate and modern remote viewers alike. The first was his six stages of remote viewing, which was essentially a progressive process leading to increased psychic contact with the target, which I'll explain. Stage one is major gestalt. So, the word gestalt means a unified whole, where the individual parts can't really be distinguished from the whole picture. In a remote viewing sense, this first stage is a very general visual understanding of the target. For example, an ice-covered mountain, or a land surrounded by water. Stage two is sensory contact, where the remote viewer begins to take in sensory details, describing the target through touch, taste, sound, and smell. For example, a cold sensation, a windswept feeling, or the rotten egg stench of sulfur. Stage three is dimension motion mobility which occurs when the viewer can psychically move around the target and observe it from various angles. For example, floating across the interior of a building or rising up for a panoramic view of the site. Stage four is quantitative aspects, where the remote viewing is finally stable enough that the viewer can observe and accurately count the number of things. For example, five torpedoes or three large buildings clustered together as a single facility. Stage five is qualitative aspects, and this is when the viewer begins to understand the target's inherent qualities. For example, a living organism, scientific research, or a military setting. Stage six is analytical aspects, where the viewer takes the qualitative aspects of the previous stage and analyzes them to produce more specific descriptions of the target. For example, a Soviet submarine a biomedical research facility, or a nuclear weapons storehouse. Ingo Swan's six-stage method was primarily used by SRI in training remote viewers, but it was also a sort of self-hypnosis technique that even the best viewers would follow to maintain a consistent methodology with maximum accuracy. Beyond these six stages, Swan is also remembered for his invention of a remote viewing technique that not even believers at the time thought was possible. It was known as coordinate remote viewing. Prior to this, when remote viewing was done at a distance, a person known as a beacon would be sent to the target site to act as a signal source, using their presence to guide the remote viewer to that location. Obviously, this presented a serious problem if the CIA hoped to spy on foreign targets, but coordinate remote viewing would be the solution. As explained by Dr. Patov, quote, Swan proposed a series of experiments in which the target was designated not by sending a beacon person to the target site, but rather by the use of geographical coordinates, latitude and longitude in degrees, minutes, and seconds. And needless to say, this proposal seemed even more outrageous than ordinary remote viewing. The difficulties in taking this proposal seriously designing protocols to eliminate the possibility of a combination of globe memorization and eidetic or photographic memory, and so forth, are discussed in considerable detail elsewhere. Suffice it to say that investigation of this approach, which we designated scanning, scanning by coordinate, eventually provided us with sufficient evidence to bring it up to the contract monitors and suggest a test under their control. End quote. As we know, SCANI, short for Scanning by Coordinate, would be Stargate's first codename when this initial pilot program was upgraded to the status of Special Access, aka Top Secret, in 1973. 
Simply put, the coordinate remote viewing method was a breakthrough for both the CIA and SRI. It not only significantly expanded the scope of what remote viewing could possibly accomplish, but somehow it was also far more effective. Coordinate remote viewing, also known as CRV, is a bit strange to say the least. In this method, the session monitor is provided with a geographical coordinate, which is latitude and longitude, written in degrees, minutes, and seconds. Of course, both the monitor and the remote viewer are blind as to what the target will be. Once the viewer indicates that they're ready, the monitor then reads the coordinates out loud, which the viewer writes down on a piece of paper, and immediately, the session begins. What's absolutely wild though, is that the remote viewer is typically not given access to a map or a globe. They're simply supposed to remote view based on the coordinates alone. Now, I know that sounds completely ridiculous. Obviously the remote viewer is trained to read and understand coordinates, but how are they supposed to use them without a map to reference? So this is surprisingly obscure info, but I managed to dig up a declassified CIA document titled Coordinate Remote Viewing, Theory and Dynamics, which explains the absolutely bizarre concept of how this works. And fair warning, this is some pretty brain melting stuff. But despite that, the official document begins with a reassuring message, quote, the basic theory of how CRV coordinate remote viewing works is very logical and is easily comprehended, even by a non-psychic. While many theory questions remain unanswered, the fact is, the stuff works. A summary of the CRV theory would follow along these lines. Somewhere, perhaps in the unconscious mind, there exists what we will label the matrix. The matrix knows no boundaries and has no limitations. It contains all information about all things. It could be thought of as omnipotent, or you could think of it as a database, etc. The matrix has within it patterns. Think of these as points within a three-dimensional box. See illustration two. The patterns within the matrix each pose and radiate their own energy. This energy is emitted in the form of a signal or signal line, which is peculiar to that specific pattern. This pattern has other names by which it is known. It can be referred to as a thought ball or as a gestalt. A gestalt can be described as the pattern and all of its associated patterns. See illustration three. The monitor will read the viewer a set of encrypted coordinates, for example, 31 degrees 42 minutes east and 20 degrees 16 minutes north. In very basic terms, the viewer's autonomic nervous system will respond to energy produced by the gestalt, or pattern, and this response will manifest itself on the ideogram. Side note, the ideogram is a simple symbolic representation of the gestalt, somewhat subconsciously drawn on a piece of paper by the remote viewer, which shows that the signal has been psychically registered. It is this registration on the ideogram that indicates that the viewer is receiving the signal line of the gestalt. The viewer will begin receiving impressions or perceptions of the target area, keyed to the specific issues he is concerned with. For example, structure, terrain, emotions, etc. See illustration 5. What has been discussed here is theory. Much cannot be explained, measured, or quantified to the standards demanded by the scientific community. While analytical data may not be in abundance to support this theory, session reports and historical and experimental data exist to substantiate the fact that CRV is a reality." End quote. Okay, so I don't expect you to understand really any of this right now, and don't worry about it, the most successful remote viewers of Stargate never really understood it either. And no, I didn't leave out any key information this document really is just that esoteric. But regardless of how coordinate remote viewing actually works, like the beginning of the document said, the fact is, the stuff works, which you'll see serious evidence of in just a minute. And this is why very early on, the CIA decided to focus almost all of Stargate's resources 
on remote viewing specifically. Speaking of remote viewing though, Halpatov and Russell Targ were actually the ones to first coin this term. They wanted to distinguish it from clairvoyance, which is close to the same idea, receiving information through extrasensory perception. And so they thought of remote viewing as a sort of subcategory of clairvoyance, with a special emphasis on uncreative and emotionless sensory data. The goal was not to perceive all planes of existence or explore the truth of the matrix. Remote viewing was supposed to be a structured technique to observe things in the physical world as we know it. However, as the two laser physicists would soon learn, remote viewing would never be that straightforward. During his time in the Stargate project, the psychic Ingo Swan demonstrated a range of incredible abilities, from psychokinesis to astral projection, and of course, remote viewing. In most documentation of the Stargate project, two key psychics are always named and Swan is one of them. The other though was a former police officer named Pat Price. Price didn't have such a broad range of psychic powers as Swan, whom he often worked with, but he was, without a doubt, the most gifted remote viewer in the entire history of the Stargate project. As Russell Targ recounted in his memoir, Remote Viewing at Stanford Research Institute in the 1970s, quote, Pat Price was a gift to our research at SRI. One day in June of 1973, Pat called Hal Patoff to say that he had been following our work, and felt that he had been doing that kind of psychic thing for years, catching crooks when he was the police commissioner in Burbank, California. He told us that he would sit with the dispatcher in the police station, and whenever he heard a crime reported, he would psychically scan the city and send a car to the spot where he saw a frightened man hiding. Our impression after we began working with Price was that he lived his life as a completely integrated psychic person. We worked with other talented individuals, but no one with the continuous psychic awareness of the world around him, which Price showed." End quote. Some of the most shocking revelations of what remote viewing was capable of, such as the ability to see across time, came from the experiments conducted at SRI with Pat Price, and his successes remain some of the strongest evidence that the phenomenon actually exists. According to the declassified CIA report made by the first project officer of Scanate, Dr. Kenneth A. Kress, quote, During the summer of 1973, SRI continued working informally with a CIA officer on a remote viewing experiment, which eventually stimulated more CIA-sponsored investigations of parapsychology. The target was a vacation property in the eastern United States. The experiment began with the passing of nothing more than the geographic coordinates of the vacation property to the SRI physicists, who in turn passed them to the two subjects, one of whom was Pat Price. No maps were permitted, and the subjects were asked to give an immediate response of what they remotely viewed at these coordinates. The subjects came back with descriptions which were apparently missed. They both talked about a military-like facility. Nevertheless, a striking correlation of the two independent descriptions was noted. The correlation caused the CAA officer to drive to the site and investigate in more detail. To the surprise of the officer, he soon discovered a sensitive government installation just a few miles from the vacation property. This discovery led to a request to have Price provide information concerning the interior workings of this particular site. The evaluation was, as usual, mixed. Pat Price, who had no military or intelligence background, provided a list of project titles associated with current and past activities, including one of extreme sensitivity. Also the codename of the site was provided. Other information concerning the physical layout of the site was accurate. Some information, such as the names of the people at the site, proved incorrect." End quote. Because Price produced the titles of several classified projects contained in a locked filing cabinet underground, among other intimate details such as the exact codename of the secret government facility, which in theory 
he should have never known even existed. This triggered a serious security investigation to find out how this information was leaked. But the result was inconclusive. There was no conceivable way Price, Targ, or Patov could have obtained any of those details. So this success resulted in a massive wave of funding, increasing the scope of the project and the CIA's first serious remote viewing operation, which we'll get into in a minute. But before we do, that last part of Dr. Kress's account, that much of the information provided by Pat Price was incorrect introduces one of the most fundamental truths of remote viewing. That the data it provides is extremely unreliable by nature. Some details may be strikingly accurate, but usually most of them are flat out wrong. You might think about it like noise on a radio station or fuzz on a TV channel. Except in the case of remote viewing, there's no way to tell good or bad information apart. The final director of the Stargate project, the nuclear physicist Dr. Edwin May, stated in an interview that, quote, There's a concept in statistics called non-stationary. What that means is that the phenomenon comes and goes in unpredictable ways, end quote. Interestingly, this non-stationary problem seems to affect not just remote viewing, but all psychic abilities that have been observed in a scientific setting. Near the end of his career, the parapsychologist J.G. Pratt argued that parapsychology, unlike the conventional sciences, would never be able to develop a replicable experiment. He stated that psychic abilities were real, but deliberate control would forever elude the practitioner. Therefore, the most convincing evidence was unlikely to be repeated. This tricky dilemma would cause great problems for the Stargate project. Many of those who controlled the funding and the ultimate fate of Stargate were those who had little appreciation for statistical evidence, and instead expected that remote viewing either worked or it didn't. That if the information wasn't accurate as if the viewer had actually been there in the flesh, the experiment should be considered a failure, as was the conclusion of many evaluators. That does raise the question though, just how accurate does a remote viewing need to be? What percentage or frequency of correct versus incorrect? Where is the line drawn between the real deal and simply a lucky guess? One of the most important principles of the scientific method is reproducibility, the ability to replicate results again and again with a high degree of reliability. That's not how remote viewing works though, so how can it ever be accepted as a scientific fact? One of the two primary evaluators of the CIA's final Stargate assessment was the statistician Dr. Jessica Utz, and she provided this answer in her report. Quote, Few human capabilities are perfectly replicable in demand. For example, even the best hitters in the major baseball leagues cannot hit on demand. Nor can we predict when someone will hit or when they will score a home run. In fact, we cannot even predict whether or not a home run will occur in a particular game. That does not mean that home runs don't exist. Scientific evidence in the statistical realm is based on replication of the same average performance or relationship over the long run. A good baseball hitter will not hit the ball exactly the same proportion of times in each game, but it should be relatively consistent over the long run. The same should be true of psychic functioning. The anticipated levels of functioning may vary based on the individual players and the conditions, just as it does in baseball, but given players of similar ability tested under similar conditions, the results should be replicable over the long run. In any area of science, evidence based on statistics comes from comparing what actually happened to what should have happened by chance." End quote. Now, I have more to say on Stargate statistics, but for now, let's return back to Pat Price as his next project remains one of the most famous of his entire remote viewing career. At this point in time, pressures were high to demonstrate the intelligence gathering potential of remote viewing in a real operation of national defense. So in July of 1974, 
Pat Price was selected for the CIA's very first operational remote viewing assignment to corroborate details of a secret Soviet nuclear lab with photographs taken by a US spy satellite. At the time, this was the longest distance remote viewing ever performed in a scientific setting, at 10,000 miles away from the target. In the words of the project officer, Dr. Kruss, quote, The target was the Semipalatinsk Unidentified Research and Development Facility, 3, URDF-3. The experimental collection would use our best subject, Pat Price. From experience, it was obvious that Price produced bad data as well as good. I reviewed the photos of URDF-3 and chose two features which, if Price described them, would show the channel at least partially working. These features were the tall crane and the four structures resembling oil well derricks. The experiment began with my branch chief and me briefing Targ and Patov in a motel. Later, at SRI, Price was briefed by Targ and Patov. Since Targ and Patov presumably knew nothing about URDF-3, the protocol guarded against queuing and or telepathy. Initially, Price was given only the geographic coordinates, a world atlas map marked with the approximate location of URDF-3 and told it was a Soviet rd &E test site. Overnight, he produced the drawing on the bottom right of figure 1b. Price further mentioned this was a damned big crane because he saw a person walk by and he only came up to the axles of the wheels. This performance caught my attention, but with two more days of work, we never heard about the derricks. He did nevertheless produce some amazing descriptions like buildings then under construction, spherical tank sections, and the crane, end quote. Here's what Price saw in his own words, quote, I am lying on my back on the roof of a two or three story brick building. It's a sunny day. The sun feels good. There's the most amazing thing. There's a giant gantry crane moving back and forth over my head. As I drift up in the air and look down, it seems to be riding on a track with one rail on each side of the building. I've never seen anything like that." End quote. This particular viewing assignment took several days for Price to complete, where he drew a number of items confirmed by the spy satellite photos, as Cross mentioned. But the crane was definitely the most convincing. This was a humongous gantry crane supported by four legs, each leg equipped with two large wheels for a total of eight wheels. I mean, you can take a close look yourself. The satellite photo is on the left and Price's drawing is on the right. This was carefully controlled by the CIA and no one at SRI had access to the photos, let alone any information on the site itself, beyond the fact that it was a Soviet research facility. Dr. Kress continues, quote, Two analysts, a photo interpreter at IAS and a nuclear analyst at Los Alamos Scientific Laboratories, agreed that Price's description of the crane was accurate. The nuclear analyst wrote that, 1. He, the subject, actually saw it through remote viewing, or 2. He was informed what to draw by someone knowledgeable of URDF-3. But again, since there was so much bad information mixed in with the good, the overall result was not considered useful. The CIA officers concluded that, since there were no control experiments to compare with, the data were nothing but lucky guessing. I began to doubt my own objectivity in evaluating the significance of paranormal abilities to intelligence collection. As a check on myself, I asked for a critique of the investigation from a disinterested consultant a theoretical physicist with a broad intellectual background. After being acquainted with the CIA data, his conclusion was, a large body of reliable experimental evidence points to the inescapable conclusion that extrasensory perception does exist as a real phenomenon, albeit characterized by rarity and lack of reliability. This judgment by a competent scientist gave impetus to continue serious inquiry into parapsychology." End quote. Despite the mixed results from URDF-3, it wasn't long after these events that an audio spying team at the CIA heard about Pat Price and his uncanny drawing of the gantry crane. 
and they requested that their superiors give Price another shot. The targets they suggested were two foreign embassies. Now, as you might imagine, installing audio spying systems in a foreign embassy was an extremely difficult and risky job, particularly because the interior layouts of these buildings would need to be secretly surveyed and mapped over long periods of time. So, how accurately could a remote viewer do it from the outside? Dr. Kress recounts, quote, the interiors of the two foreign embassies were known to the audio teams who had made entries several years previously. Price was to visit these embassies by his remote viewing capability, locate the code rooms, and come up with information that might allow a member of the audio team to determine whether Price was likely to be of operational use in subsequent operations. Price was given operationally acceptable data such as the exterior photographs and the geographical coordinates of the embassies. In both cases, Price correctly located the code rooms. He produced copious data, such as the location of interior doors and colors of marble stairs and fireplaces that were accurate and specific. As usual, much was also vague and incorrect. Regardless, the operations officer involved concluded it is my considered opinion that this technique, whatever it is, offers definite operational possibilities." End quote. After this success, in 1975, Dr. Kenneth A. Kress completed his position as the first project officer of Scanate, the first iteration of the Stargate project, and he ended his report to the CIA with the following statements. Quote, there are observations that defy explanation. Coincidence is not likely and fraud has not been discovered. How is it that the phenomenon remains controversial and receives so little official government support? End quote. Dr. Kress wrote that in 1977, but his fateful words would ring true for decades. In 1995, the CIA commissioned a report that would be the most extensive, meticulous, and critical evaluation in Stargate's history, and it led to the CIA cancelling the project for good. However, one conclusion is repeated dozens of times from the beginning to the end of the document. Quote, a statistically significant laboratory effect has been demonstrated in the sense that hits occur more often than chance. End quote. The consensus of the entire panel of experts was that a statistically significant anomaly was occurring. That was overwhelmingly agreed upon. However, the majority of the report's contributors were not convinced that the anomaly was a result of psychic abilities. They could offer no other explanation, but simply doubted the psychic explanation because there's never been any irrefutable evidence that psychic abilities actually exist. Frankly speaking, if psychic abilities do exist, they might forever elude scientific explanation, not unlike many other aspects of the human condition, such as consciousness. But regardless of the cause, the phenomenon of remote viewing has been observed scientifically through 23 years of statistical data. So it doesn't have to be psychic, it could be quantum physics, primal empathy, universal consciousness, or Divine sight has a God-given miracle. The point is that regardless of how it works, the phenomenon seems to exist, at least by statistical analysis. In Pat Price's case though, these CIA operations and experiments were not statistically evaluated. However, the feats he pulled off surely speak for themselves. Locating the secret code rooms of two foreign embassies, sketching a Soviet gantry crane with highly unique features and providing the exact code name of a sensitive government site, among other very specific details. If you're still skeptical, I don't blame you. As far as I can tell, there are five possibilities. The first is that legitimate remote viewing occurred. Simply put, he saw it through his mind's eye. The second is that he was fed the information. Someone gave him the answers. As we've seen throughout Dr. Kress's report, and also stated in the CIA's 1995 evaluation, quote, All known channels for receiving the information are blocked. The monitor is blind to the answer as well. End quote. 
It shouldn't need to be said that the CIA wanted an effective solution, so why would they taint their own experiment? The lengths they went through to keep Price, Targ, and Patoff blind to the answers are well documented. There were also instances when remote viewers saw something that would have been impossible for any involved party to know about, including the CIA, and we'll be exploring an example of that soon. The third possibility is that Pat Price was just a lucky guesser, as two of the CIA's evaluators suggested. But how lucky can a person be? In the now declassified transcripts, Price guessed exactly two names of the secret site, and those were Hayfork and Haystack. It's unknown which one of these was correct, but one of them was. Consider this, Hayfork is seven letters and Haystack is eight. According to the 2020 Scrabble official tournament and club word list, there are more than 25,000 words with seven letters and more than 31,000 with eight. That's a lot of words. So in the absolute most ideal circumstances where we assume that Price knew for sure that it was exactly seven letters and a real word for that matter, he'd still have around a one in 25,000 chance. The fifth possibility is that Price could have been extremely deductive. Now, there's no existing theories or even a scrap of evidence on how he could have deduced the information he provided, but let's just assume that he really was that clever and observant. That would constitute fraud, but what would be his motive? If it was money, the budget during the days of Scanate was quite low compared to the project iterations that followed. and. Price would have made far more as a professional blackjack player. If it was fame, no one outside of Stargate knew who Pat Price was until the project's declassification. And if it was personal validation, there would be no point to fraud. So finally, what if the documentation itself is fraudulent, either manipulated to fit a narrative or even completely made up? Well, there's a lot of players involved. We've got Pat Price, the researchers at SRI, also SRI itself and its stakeholders. And then we've got the CIA and its various departments, project officers like Dr. Kress and a host of independent evaluators. Any sort of fraud from these accounts is not only extremely unlikely, but would have been immensely difficult to pull off. The results of Price's experiments are repeated in other CIA documents as well and actual transcripts of his remote viewings are available. With all that said, I've saved perhaps the two strangest of Price's successes for last, and these two will definitely get you thinking about remote viewing's true scope of potential. The first one occurred in 1974, and I'll be recounting through the words of Russell Targ in his 1996 article, quote, in one of the formal studies, which Hal and I published in our IEEE paper, the target turned out to be a swimming pool complex at Rinconada Park in Palo Alto, about five miles from SRI. As I sat with Price in an electrically shielded Faraday cage on the second floor of the SRI radio physics building, Hal and Bart were in Bart's office on the ground floor, choosing a target card from a target pool of which I had no knowledge. Pat Price polished his gold wire-rimmed glasses on a white linen handkerchief, leaned back in his chair, and closed his eyes. On this particular day, Price said that he saw a circular pool of water, about 100 feet in diameter. It was actually 110 feet in diameter. He also saw a rectangular pool, about 60 by 80 feet on a side. This pool happens to be 75 by 100 feet. He went on to describe a concrete block house which is also at the site. That remarkable accuracy was one of the hallmarks of Price's work. However, this illustration also shows one of the problems that must be dealt with in remote viewing. Having described the target with great accuracy, as yet unknown to us, Price told me that he thought the target seemed to be a water purification plant. He then went on to create some non-existent water storage tanks in the picture and put rotating machinery in the pools." End quote. So if we zoom in a bit on the map on the left, figure 1a, compared with Price's sketch on the right, 1b, 
we can see that Price viewed the circular pool and the rectangular pool, though he got their positions mixed up. However, he correctly placed them above the block house, which he accurately described as made of concrete. He also correctly drew the three-section playground to the left of the pools, which he labeled as some yard. Also keep in mind that neither Pat Price nor his monitor Russell Targ knew the site had anything to do with water to begin with, so even the nature of what he drew is pretty telling. But despite these accuracies, he described the location not as a swimming pool complex, but as a water purification plant, and those two side-by-side -side water tanks, which he labeled as above ground, simply didn't exist. Returning to Russell Targ's account, quote, that was the story as I understood it, as of March 15th, 1995. However, on March 16th, I received the annual report of the city of Palo Alto celebrating its centennial year. On page 22 of that report, it is stated that in 1913, a new municipal waterworks was built on the site of the present Rinconada Park. End quote. A municipal waterworks is a facility where a city's water supply is pumped, and you guessed it, purified, exactly as Price insisted. And here in figure 1c is the old image included with the annual report, taken in 1913 of this waterworks facility, a water tower with two water tanks side by side. If we accept that remote viewing exists, and that the remote viewer can travel across virtually any distance in space, theoretically they should be able to traverse through time as well. After all, this is in line with Albert Einstein's theory that the space and time are not separate, but actually interwoven in what is known as the space-time continuum. In this instance, Pat Price saw into the past, and in remote viewing literature, this is known as retrocognition. In Targ's own words, quote, This amazing phenomenon demonstrates an important feature of remote viewing targeting, namely that one must specify not only the target location to be observed, but the time as well. All these years we've been criticizing Price for making up an erroneous water purification plant, whereas in reality, he was looking 50 years back along the timeline and telling us what was there at that time." End quote. What Russell Targ goes rather light on though, are the deep and complicated implications that come with this in regard to the relativity of time and our ability to consciously or even unconsciously access it. We'll get deeper into this in part 2 when we explore a case of precognition, or the ability for a remote viewer to see into the future. But for the final and perhaps most wild revelation in Pat Price's remote viewing career, we need to travel back in time, back to the CIA operation with URDF-3, the secret Soviet nuclear lab with the giant gantry crane. In my opinion, this is possibly the strongest evidence of remote viewing, beyond the statistical data, and that's because there's simply no other explanation with the exception of chalking it up to a really, really lucky guess. As we know, the URDF-3 operation took several days in multiple viewing sessions. On the first day, Pat Price mentioned the crane where he envisioned himself psychically lying on top of the building. This building had him curious though, so in later sessions he focused on what was actually going on inside of the building, which there were no images of, as it was covered and impossible for the CIA's spy satellites to capture. Eventually, he was able to penetrate into the building and, after careful observation, he described the interior activities. Quote, People were assembling a giant 60-foot diameter metal sphere using thick metal gores, like sections of an orange peel. But the workmen were having trouble welding it all together, as the pieces were warping. They were therefore looking for a lower temperature welding material." End quote. Russell Targ himself called this the most interesting thing Price ever remote viewed because it was, quote, unknown to anyone in our government at the time. We didn't get any feedback on this for more than three years after the 1974 operation. We discovered how accurate Price's viewings were when this sphere fabricating activity at Semipalatinsk was eventually described in Aviation Week magazine, May 2nd, 
1977. End quote. So, looking at an archive copy of the Aviation Week issue, the article in question is titled, Soviets Push for Beam Weapon. The key section is halfway through the article, and it reads, quote, The U.S. used high-resolution photographic reconnaissance satellites to watch as the Soviet technicians had four holes dug through solid granite formations not far from the main large building at the facility. In a nearby building, huge, extremely thick steel gores were manufactured. The building has since been removed. These steel segments were parts of a large sphere, estimated to be about 18 meters, 57.8 feet, in diameter. Enough gores for two complete spheres were constructed. U.S. officials believe these spheres are needed to capture and store energy from nuclear-driven explosions or pulse power generators. These steel gores are believed by some officials to be among the earliest clues as to what might be taking place at the facility." End quote. By the time this article was published, 1977, Pat Price had been dead for two years. In 1975, in the midst of a CIA operation where he was tasked to remote view a Libyan missile training site, he died suddenly of a heart attack. Price was 57 years old. In a bit of a melancholy appreciation, both Targ and Patov viewed this post-mortem success as one of the most indisputable instances of remote viewing. Quote, This shows that Price's remarkable perception was a direct experience of the site. He was not reading the mind of the sponsor because no one in the United States knew of the spheres, nor could Pat have been precognitively looking at his feedback from the future because he received none before his passing. Price should be considered among the ranks of the psychic superstars." End quote. Here we see the sketch that he made and his approximate measurements of one of the 60-foot steel gores. And as the caption notes, Price had the size correct within 18 inches. Some people seek the unknown, but it's safe to say that most of the world is more comfortable with a straightforward understanding of life. Some people find that comfort in mainstream science and others in religion. And if you're still a skeptic, that's alright. After all, we haven't yet covered the CIA's final evaluation, which is perhaps the most important document of them all due to its scientific depth. So for now, just humor the idea that remote viewing is possible. What are the implications if remote viewing is a real ability? What would that mean about our reality and the world we live in? The life or lives we live? Before we conclude this first part of our Stargate investigation, this is something we need to discuss. Simply put, the ability to remote view implies a non-local nature of consciousness, that our consciousness is not contained in our brain. Consciousness thus exists outside of any location in space and time. It might also imply that all of us are connected to a single universal consciousness that, for whatever reason, every individual person experiences as a personal and local conscious mind. That would mean that in our human bodies, we are simply observers. A 2020 research article titled The Non-Local Universe theorizes, quote, The only way that we are able to know the physical world, and that includes the brains that neuroscientists study, is by observation and conceptualization. And both of these psychological processes operate within the mind of the observer, end quote. This is somewhat consistent with modern science, with recent findings in quantum physics challenging the idea of a local realist worldview. However, there are still many questions and we're really just on the cutting edge. To quote an article written by Dr. Jessica Utz, quote, The equations of quantum physics, if taken literally, imply a universe that is constantly splitting into separate branches only one of which corresponds to our perceived reality. A process of decoherence has been invoked to stop two branches interfering with each other, but this still does not answer the question of why our experience is of one particular branch and not any other. 
this idea perhaps makes sense in the light of theories that presuppose that quantum theory is not the ultimate theory of nature, but involves the manifestations of a deeper sub-quantum domain. In just the same way that a surfrider can make use of random waves to travel effortlessly along, a psychic may be able to direct random energy at the sub-quantum level for her own purposes. Some accounts of the sub-quantum level involve action at a distance, which fits in well with some purported psychic abilities." End quote. Speaking of remote viewing specifically, there is evidence in quantum physics that, for example, a psychic may be able to connect themselves from this perceived reality to any specific point in the space-time continuum. In the early 1960s, the quantum physicist John Stuart Bell proposed a now famous theorem known as Bell's inequalities that argues that quantum mechanics violates the principles of local realism. And since then, decades of rigorous experiments have consistently demonstrated a phenomenon known as quantum entanglement, which is when two or more particles are linked in a certain way, and remain linked regardless of how far apart they are in space. These non-local connections share a common unified quantum state, which means that an entangled particle will reflect information about the other particle they're linked with and any action done to these particles will have an immediate effect on the other particles in the entangled system. Basically, even if we put two of these particles at opposite ends of the galaxy, they'd still reflect the state of the other instantaneously, which causes a paradox because that violates the limit of the speed of light. And for this paradox, there is no resolution. Regardless, this the principle of quantum mechanics remains verified to this day. Albert Einstein famously called this effect, quote, spooky action at a distance, end quote. And it's fair to say that remote viewing is a bit spooky. It may very well be explainable by science. We just haven't answered all the questions yet. But it would be silly to disregard the possibility of its existence and the findings of the Stargate project despite the negative stigma that's haunted it since its disclosure. In our next episode, part 2, we'll explore the evolution of the Stargate project. Then we'll dive into the actual military missions carried out by a specialized unit of psychic soldiers. And finally, we'll tackle the final evaluation report commissioned by the CIA, all in epic fashion of course. You'll get the information that's left out in almost all other modern coverage of the Stargate project. I dig things up for a living, so stick around. Part 2 is coming next week. If you haven't watched my recent video on Nikola Tesla, I definitely recommend you check that one out. Not only are there a ton of connections you'll make regarding psychic abilities, which Tesla almost certainly had, but his theories on universal consciousness are quite the trip. You'll learn about his esoteric beliefs and also a few obscure conspiracy theories, so don't miss it. Thank you to my patrons, your incredible support made this episode happen, and if you'd like to join in on helping me produce this type of content, I've got links in the description below. All proceeds go back to these videos. Lastly, don't forget to try out Blinkist with my link and learn a bit about quantum physics to prep for the next video. I'm Mr. Mythos, you guys are awesome, I'll see you in the next one, peace.